Me being a subtenant in this co-op building, I was keen to maintain kind of a low profile, just be a good neighbor, be friendly to everybody, be polite, hold doors, that sort of thing. Um, not make too much noise, not draw too much attention to myself. Um, unlike the family, maybe, who lived in the unit below me in, in 1D, uh, I never quite, in the seven years I was in that building, I never quite sussed out the nature of the relationship between the adults in that space. India, uh, the woman who lived there, she was probably in her mid to late 30s. She had a, a, little, a little baby uh, who by the time I left was a, you know, a, big, a big toddler. Um, and then there was the man who lived in that apartment with them. And I could never figure out if he was India's partner, cousin, brother. It was never made clear to me. I never saw a moment of affection between them. But you never know what goes on behind closed doors. Perhaps they're not the kind of people that are going to demonstrate any affection they have. Or maybe they are just roommates or friends. I, I don't know. Uh, but I never met India formally. The only reason I knew her name was because this man, who was Puerto Rican, he was without hair, sort of stout of build, faded tattoos on his arms and a big, dark, thick tattoo here on his neck. Always a scowling look on his face. Sort of a rough and tumble guy. Looked like he'd been down some hard roads. The sort of dude who, if I'd encountered him at 2 o'clock in the morning on a darkened subway platform, I wouldn't have been afraid, but my guard would have been up a little bit. I'd have been aware of his proximity to me. But I didn't see him in that regard. He was my neighbor. He lived in the apartment beneath me. We'd see each other checking mail. And his name, or at least what we called him, was Tattoo. We called him Tattoo. Tattoo was a scrounger. He was always digging around in things and making things work and fixing things that had broken. And he was, it was, it became clear to me over years, little bits of, just little bits of innuendo that I picked up, that he'd been down some hard roads, he had had some hard times, and he was just trying to make the best of things, just trying to get by in the only way that he knew how. You know, if someone's air conditioning unit broke and sat down on the curb, Tattoo would be in there, lickety split, and peel all the copper out of that because there's no reason to let that go to waste. You know, he was always futzing with things. But I never met India. I would just hear Tattoo out amongst the garbage cans calling out, India! 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 This, like, six or seven, maybe eight times Tattoo would call to India before she would finally crank open a window and go, what? <laughs> and then they'd sort of bark, like, sort of patter at each other in Spanish, most of which I couldn't pick up and go about their, their regular day. So Tattoo was somebody that I saw about on the regular. He picked up pretty quickly that I was just always going to be polite with him. Never really had an interaction beyond just hellos in the hallway, though. Uh, until 2009, uh, a lot of things had happened in the four years that I'd been living there at that point. I'd finished, I'd gone back to school, I'd had a, a funky job, those are a separate story. I was now done with school, I was leaving the funky job, and I was about to launch my way around the country on a national storytelling tour. So I wasn't coming back to the apartment, I wasn't going back to the job, and I needed to get rid of everything. I was selling things online, and I was putting things on the curb, and Tattoo picked up pretty quickly on the fact that I was just putting a bunch of junk out on the curb. So I told him, I said one day in the after, I, one afternoon in the hallway, I saw him and I said, you know, I've got, I'm getting out of here and I got all this stuff that I don't need. So if you want any of it, come on up. And he said, really? And I said, yeah, just bring it like a duffel bag or a box or something to carry the stuff away. And he was like, all right, all right. And a few more days passed and I got rid of a few more things and sometimes I'd see him kind of, you know, faffing around through the piles that I put out on the curb. But we were coming right up on my departure and it was all, you know, if, you, if you're moving, uh, or any time that you have, like, just try to de-junk, get things out of your house, you get down to that last little stash. Everything's just little knick-knackies, and nothing has a home. And, like, where did, how do I even own this stuff? Like, where did it come from? I had a pile of that in my living room, which was now devoid of furniture as I was peeling away all these parts and pieces of my life. And I saw a tattoo again, and I, I, I encouraged him to grab a duffel bag, and he came up to my apartment. And I wish, there, there's no way for me to express to you how extraordinary were the movements, the economical movements of this man who came into my apartment with these two duffel bags. And for me, after weeks of trying to shed all this crap in my life, Tattoo just went Thanks. <laughs> and it was gone. And I, I can't deny, I made some assumptions based on some of that, but I was just so pleased to have it all out of there that I went downstairs where he was like, kind of digging through and trying to decide what to do with any of these pieces. And I asked him back upstairs for a beer just to thank him and sit down. And apart from inviting him in here into my apartment, you know, to 
take this junk off my hands. It was the most intimate invitation I'd ever extended the man. I'm, I'm not asking him to do me a favor now. I want him to come back in and just sit with, with me for, for a beer and thank him and, you know, just chit-chat. So he comes up and we have a beer. And over the course of this beer, I don't know if it was just the, the strangeness of this new environment the two of us found ourselves in, or if it was the freedom in knowing that I was soon about to set foot out the door, and to the best of his knowledge, I'd never be back again. But Tattoo saw fit to walk me down some of his lanes, his memory lanes, and share with me stories about where he'd come from. We didn't talk long, but he'd been in some serious trouble at certain points in his life. That, that dark tattoo on his neck, it wasn't just uh, a, a signifier of something that was important to him. It also hid a mark on his throat where he had taken a part of a bullet. And he didn't get into the details as to how that had happened or why, and I didn't ask. I didn't need to know. Uh, at the end of our beer, grateful for the moment and feeling connected to this neighbor who's been living directly beneath me for the last four years, I pulled down a, a bottle of Irish whiskey that I had up on top of my fridge, and I poured each of us a little shooter. And uh, we raised our glasses, and we clinked them together, and we each took our little shot. And I set mine down, and uh, Tattoo looked at his glass, and he went, yeah. <laughs> and he set his glass down, and we shook hands, and he thanked me, and, and he left the room. And he was, he was gone now, out of my space, out of my home. And I'm looking at these two little empty shot glasses um, and thinking about everything that's just transpired, how, how quickly all of this has occurred after these four years of being so near to one another, having this intimate moment and having shared a beer and my stuff being in his apartment right now and these two little shots that we've had and the bullet in his neck. And I'm looking at these glasses and I'm thinking about the face he made after he had that sip of whiskey and I couldn't help but think. I'm a badass. <laughs> <laughs>